You are looking good this morning. <laughs> yes, sir, Ree. I'm proud of you. Survived Christmas and uh, all the rush and all that sort of stuff. And that's, that's good. That's good. It's good to see you this morning. I love being here with you. This is the second week of our series, Satan's Favorite Lies. Last week we talked about Satan's favorite, God can't be trusted. And I hope you came away armed with enough ammunition to resist and refute that lie. We, we learned that God, in fact, is the only one who can really be trusted in this world. We have to be on guard. We have to be aware of the quick, small twistings of truth, the half-truth that Satan is so fond of, and so, so that we can avoid falling into one of his traps. Today we're going to talk about another of Satan's favorite lies. If it feels right, it can't be wrong. A corollary to this is one I grew up with uh, during the 60s. If it feels good, do it. We're going to approach it from the point of view that most have, uh, of you have learned uh, to trust our, uh, the five senses that you have, and we've learned to trust our consciences. And that's why we have to be careful, because both, both our senses and our conscience will betray us. They are two of the devil's favorite tools to take us off track. Before we begin, let's, let's have a word of prayer together. Say after me, I love you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I want to serve you with my life. Creator God, Savior Jesus, blessed Spirit, help me see God's truth today. Blind my eyes to Satan's temptations and keep me from falling prey to his designs. Open my eyes to your truth and love and wonder an amazing grace, dear Lord. Keep me safe and sound and allow me to serve you in this world and in the next. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll take out your message notes this morning. They're printed inside your worship folder. At the end of, uh, of your notes is a list of resources that will help you find things in the Bible that will be helpful to you when you're facing a difficult problem or a circumstance. Also in your worship folder today is uh, this week's Exploring the Message notes, should you wish to spend some time during the week reviewing or going deeper into uh, today's message. If it feels wrong, can't be, if it feels right rather, can't be wrong, the devil says, trust your senses, trust your conscience. Of course, the devil would say that. I mean, think about it. How are our consciences conditioned, uh, conditioned in the world, by the world, how our conscience developed in the world and by the world. Who is the ruler of this world? The devil rules this world. We are completely in his hands. We trust our experiences and our consciences. And when we do that, we play right into Satan's hand. We use the tools he has given us. What we learn in the Bible is that there is a better standard. We learn that operating solely on the world's experiences is not sufficient to keep us on the path that God has laid out for us. We need more. We need Holy Scripture. We need the promptings, the inner promptings of the Holy Spirit. And we need wise counsel. We'll talk more about those things in a, in a couple of minutes. But right now, let's look at what the Bible says about using our sight and hearing and touch and taste and smell to discover the truth of a particular course of action. The truth about our five senses. Proverbs 14.12 says... There's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. We know that God has a plan for our lives. Jesus has told us that the road we travel is, is, is not a wide and comfortable superhighway, but a narrow and difficult path. Our challenge is to be resistant, resistant to immediately clamoring up on the easy road, the beautiful road, the fast road. And while our senses will tell us that's the easiest, most pleasant way, that's the way that's been created by the powers of this world. Will the nice road always be the wrong road? No. But the promise of an easy and comfortable life in this world does not come from God. God calls us to difficult, tenuous struggles designed to help others and serve God's purposes here on earth. It means we must raise our eyes from the easy way and lift them up to God, prepared to follow whatever path God leads us to. Jesus said, Matthew seven thirteen, even the, the, through the narrow gate, or enter, excuse me, through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. And the world would have us believe that if we live by our conscience, we'll be living a holy life. Here's what Paul said about that. 
the truth about our conscience? He said, my conscience is clear, but that isn't what matters. It's the Lord himself who will examine and decide. And here's Paul again in Romans 1.21. He says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God and give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And the result was that their minds became dark and confused. And here's Paul again, because he's got a lot to say, doesn't he? In Ephesians 4, 17, 18, he says, And so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, minded empty -headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch not only with God, but with reality itself. So, so what does the big lie look like today? I mean, we, we can read in the Bible what it looked like back in ancient times, but what does it look like today? What does, if it feels right, it can't be wrong, look like today? And what are some of the responses that we might find familiar? This is not an exhaustive list that I'm going to offer you right now, but it's some of the popular expressions that I hear. And you can probably add to the list since you've heard some good ones too, I'm sure. But let me start with one I hear pretty often. I've got total peace about it. I do a lot of counseling with folks who are struggling with one thing or another. I always try to end a counseling session by helping that person develop a plan of action. Now the action they decide on might not be the whole answer to the problem, but it must be something that will begin to lead them toward a godly resolution to the issue. And the one thing that scares me more than anything else is that when that person comes back to me and says, I have the answer and I'm completely at peace about it. Why does that scare me? Well, for several reasons it scares me. First, difficult problems seldom have a quick and easy answer. Second, I know that, uh, what the plan of action was, and it's hardly ever a plan that will put a person at ease. Doing new things, taking new actions, is not usually a peaceful undertaking. It's uncomfortable. Third, that statement is usually made with stars in the eyes and a big smile and a look at someone who's approaching a drug-induced coma. A dazzled look. And that's hardly ever a good thing. I have total peace about it, they say. And I want to say, then you didn't do it right. You can't possibly have resolved that issue. It's too big and too deep and too complex. And I'm usually right about that. But God is good and sometimes I'm wrong. I know that's hard to believe. But sometimes I'm definitely wrong. Just enough to make me certain that God is indeed at work in the lives of you and me and that nothing, nothing is too big for God. But the problem is that when someone says to me, I'm at peace with that, generally it's not God who's providing the answer. We've been too molded by this world to entirely trust our consciences. We have seen too many Godfather movies. You know, we've, we've learned that it's not personal, it's just business. We've adopted that. So many of us have. And, that, and that's the standard of the world. And when we rely on our conscience without the guidance of God, then we nearly always mess up because what we've learned in this world is to hurt each other. Here's what the Bible says. After the Israelites took over the promised land, they were managed by judges. They were preeminent men and women who listened to God, kept the peace, and, and fought according to God's direction. And during the years between judges... Uh, it, because they didn't all go just like back to back. There were sometimes 30, 40, 50 years between from one judge to another. Israel would fall back into old habits during those times and begin worshiping other gods and doing horrible things in the Bible. The introduction to the next judge invariably begins with, Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They followed their consciences and they gave in to their worldly senses. This is from the Bible, Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. They follow their conscience. And from Proverbs 12, 15, fools are headstrong and do what they like. Wise people take advice. Here are a few choice phrases you may be familiar with. Each of them were uttered by someone relying on their five senses or their conscience. In every case, they were at total peace about it. Famous last words. I know these woods like the back of my hand. Famous last words. So, how do you get the name killer? Famous last words. Relax, I minored in chemistry. Famous last words. It's fireproof. Famous last words. 
what does this button do? (laughs) Famous last words, it's probably just a rash. Famous last words, the odds of that happening have to be a million to one. Famous last words, well, these are the good kind of mushrooms. Famous last words, I'll hold it and you light the fuse. It's strong enough for both of us. Famous last words, oh, I've done this before. And my favorite of the whole group, now watch this. There's only one phrase that concerns me more than I've got total peace about it, and here it is. I've prayed about it, and I've got total peace about it. Let me tell you the story of Balaam and his donkey. You may know it. It's in the Bible. Balaam was an oracle, a soothsayer. He had cast fortunes for people, had a pretty good business. And one day a messenger came from the king to Balaam and said, the king's afraid the hordes of Israel are going to invade his kingdom and destroy the kingdom and he wants you to curse Israel. And Balaam refused. He told them that he could only say what God gave him to say. And that night, God told Balaam he should not go and curse the people of Israel because the people of Israel are blessed. And the next morning he told that to the messenger and the messenger went back to the king. The king was upset. He sent more messengers asking Balaam to come and curse Israel. And Balaam told the same thing. That night, God said, go with him, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam saddled his donkey right away and went with the messengers. Now, God hadn't told Balaam to go right now. And God had been very clear that Balaam was not to curse Israel, for Israel was blessed by God. So God got angry with Balaam because he was getting a little ahead of himself. And God sent an angel to block Balaam on the way, to block the road. It was a big angel, big angel with a big sword. Now, Balaam couldn't see the angel, but he was riding on a donkey, and the donkey could see the angel. And so the donkey swerved off the road to keep him and Balaam from being killed. And Balaam tried another route. The angel was there too, and the donkey left the road again. And third time, same thing happened. But this time, Balaam dismounted, and when he got off, he took a stick, and he was beating the donkey because he wouldn't stay on the road. At this point, God gave the donkey advice, a voice. And, and, And the donkey said to Balaam, what are you hurting me for? I've always served you well, but I see a huge angel up here with a sword that would have killed the two of us if I hadn't swerved off the road. And then God opened Balaam's eyes so Balaam could see the angel as well. And Balaam said to the angel, I've sinned. I didn't know you were blocking the road. I'll just go home. The angel said, "Uh, do what I tell you. Go with the messengers, but only say what I tell you to say. So as the story goes, Balaam goes to the king. He makes three oracles. Each of them, the king asked to be a curse of Israel, but each of them, Balaam says a blessing, much to the dismay of the king. And so the king sent Balaam home without paying him anything at all. Balaam had prayed to God, and had total peace about his decision to go right away and curse Israel. He didn't know what God would tell him to say, but the money seemed right at the time. And not long after that, Israel invaded, overwhelmed the king and his kingdom. And here's the conclusion of the story from Joshua 13, 22. In addition to those killed in the battle when Israel overwhelmed the king, Balaam, son of Beor, the soothsayer, was put to death by the people of Israel. Balaam had been told by God what to do. He was at peace with his decision, but he still got killed. And he knew the king wanted him to curse Israel, and he was prepared to do that. In fact, he was prepared to do anything the king wanted because the money was good. The only condition was that Balaam would only say what God told him to say. God intervened. And then the Israelites had the last word. See, too often when we pray, we just say what we want, and we don't spend any time listening to what God wants us to say, wants us to do. And if God does reply, we may not get the message straight, just like Balaam. There are reasons why you should not be at peace with the decision, even if you've talked with God about it. Talking to, to God is only half a prayer. You still have to listen and wait for a response. Prayer is a conversation. And we don't usually have the patience to watch and wait for the answer. 
Third response, and I'm, I'm used, to, uh, used to seeing, we've talked about two ways. If it feels good, it can't be wrong, is really wrong. Two ways that Satan convinces us to rely on our experiences and our conscience. Here's another one. This is what everyone else does. Everyone's doing it. If my neighbor buys a car, then I should buy one too. If I, my, my friend cheats on his wife, well, then I guess I can cheat on my wife too. If, uh, if my brother gets into drugs, then, well, you know how this goes. And it's all driven by what we've learned to observe in the world. We've been conditioned to see uh, how... Uh, to, to see what's going on in the world around us and, and then uh, how to change to respond to that. We've been trained. Well, from Genesis 6, you know this story. It begins with God's disappointment and anger about how humankind was acting. Everyone else does it, right? Now, God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil, imagined evil, 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 evil from morning to night. God was was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. It broke his heart. God said, I'll get rid of my ruined creation and make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes, bugs, and birds, the works. I'm sorry I made them. But Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. God took one look and saw how bad it was, everyone corrupting, uh, corrupt and corrupting, life itself corrupt to the core. And God said to Noah, it's all over. It's the end of the human race. The violence is everywhere. I'm making a clean sweep. Build yourself a ship from teak wood, God said to Noah. This is what everyone else does. Not an, ex- an adequate explanation for why we're doing it, The morals and ethics of the world are not good enough. There's evil all over. And it's our job to resist that. But we need to pattern our behavior on a higher standard, the standard of God. Everyone's doing it. It's just not good enough as we look out there and see. One of the devil's favorite lies. Here's another one. I love this excuse. I used to... uh, I used to think this when I was much heavier than I am now. This is how God made me. I, after, after all, I am a cherished child of God. I was created by God. I'm fat. That's the way I am. And uh, all this was true as far as it goes. But I discovered some time ago that God did not want me to be so heavy, and I didn't want that either. And it just took me some time to find the right combination of doctors and dietitians and a, and a good gym so that I, I could do what I knew God wanted me to do. Convincing myself that I, I was how I was because I was powerless to overcome the way I created, was created was a clever dodge. It's an easy thing to say, oh, I'm not powerful enough to change this. Just not the truth. Here's the way Peter put it. He said, now, of course, Peter, as we, we don't think, ever had a weight problem. He's speaking of lots of other issues that we face every day, issues of sinfulness, of of closing our eyes, of ignoring the pleas of the helpless and the hopeless. And here's what he says. Since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, learn to think like him. Think of your sufferings as a weaning from that old sinful habit of always expecting to get your own way. Then you'll be able to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by what you want. This is another really juicy excuse to do what, what we want. I'm just not there yet. I grew up in the 60s era of civil rights and uh, unrest and riots and assassinations. And I've always loved people, but I led a, a sheltered childhood. I had no idea that there were folks who couldn't sit at the same lunch lunch counter as me or ride in the front of the bus or shop in the same stores. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that young men of color could be lynched and were lynched in those times simply for looking at a white woman. Learning of those horrific abuses set a new course for my life. Now, I tell you all this not because I'm fond of my upbringing, but because I want you to hear what my father once told me. And we'd been talking about Martin King and the Black Panthers and Medgar Evers and, and the Freedom Riders. And I asked my father, why is all this happening? And here's what he said to me. If they would just be patient, all this will change. If, 
persons of color who were being dominated, enslaved, killed, would just be patient. Gradually, the white establishment would grant them some freedoms. What I've come to understand is that my father was dead wrong. I'm just not there yet doesn't work in the world. Those in power will not give up what they have in order for others to have something. And the powerless can't wait forever. But they will, but, but they will never be treated fairly if they do wait. Martin King said, justice delayed is justice denied. And he was dead right. I'm just not there yet. Is a cop out a way of keeping the status quo and still preserving the illusion that progress is being made or maybe some minds are being changed somewhere along the road. But action has to be taken. The reality is for any progress to be made, action has to happen. Jesus understood that and in this passage he makes it clear that I'm just not there yet is an excuse in tune with the powers of this world, not in tune with God's plan. Matthew 19. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? You know this story. And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what's good? There's only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, then keep the commandments. And the man said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother also. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to Jesus, I've kept all these. What do I still lack? And, and, and Joseph, Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, then go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. The action, you've got to take action. Then come back and follow me. And when the young man heard this word, he went away grieving. For he had many possessions. And here's Jesus' brother James putting it on the line. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it commits sin. Boom. I'm just not there yet. One of Satan's favorite lies. And here's one of the, if it feels right, it can't be wrong standards that we seem to be fond of. My situation is unique. I mean, I love to think I'm special. I don't know about you, but down deep, I'm pretty sure that I'm God's favorite. I'm pretty sure that I'm, I'm perfect deep down. I'm pretty sure that I have the answer to any issue pretty much Yep, they broke the mold after they made Doug Dean. There's no question about that. Yes, sir, I'm the one and only. And no one has ever faced the kind of problems, opportunities, and temptations I face every day. I'm sure of it. How about you? As I reflected on my personal perfection from time to time, I've come to the starting, startling conclusion that perhaps I'm not quite as special as I'd like to think. For example, my birth was pretty standard, Toledo Hospital. My upbringing was fairly normal. White, small town, loving parents, little league bikes. I grew up in white suburban America, along with about 50 million other baby boomers. And my guess is that I am anything but unique or special. And as I've been exposed to the problems and issues that confront others, I've discovered that they seem to be pretty much the same ones I face. It's kind of discouraging to realize that I may not be as special as I think. Neither are my circumstances. And as I've grown closer to God and, and learned more and more about her, I've come to know that in reality there's only been one unique person on earth. And his name was Jesus. He's different from me in two particular ways, in many but two particular ones. First of all, he was the son of God. Can't claim that one. And he was resurrected after he died and taken to live in heaven and occupy an honored place there. And I can never match that. And so whenever I begin to cough up that old lie that I'm a special case, 
I'm reminded that I'm a lot like everyone else. But I am called to do my best to live like Jesus. Paul says it this way. The sacred writings contain preliminary reports by the prophets on God's son. His ascent from David roots him in history. His unique identity as the son of God was shown by the spirit when Jesus was raised from the dead, setting him apart as the Messiah, our master. He's unique. Only one. I'm not unique. Neither are you. Neither are the life challenges we face. But Satan would have us believe that no one is more deserving than we are, more responsible than we are, more special than we are, more well-intentioned than we are, more prayerful than we are, or more comfortable with our lives and our decisions than we are. And it's all a lie. So I'd like to challenge you today to push the reset button. Instead of pulling out the standard excuses about why you do what you, only what you want to do, try looking in some new places for new input. Now I'm suggesting to you that there are three sources that every one of us could use more frequently, follow more carefully, learn more intimately. They are the Bible, conversation with the Holy Spirit, and wise counsel of Christian brothers and sisters. Our conscience and our experience are only trustworthy when they are aligned with the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and wise counsel. And you know about the Bible. The problem for most of us is that we don't use it. It sits on a shelf gathering dust. And there's a reason to that. Most of us know so little about the Bible, we don't know where to look to find the answers we need. So I've included at the bottom of your worship notes today a list of resources to help you find pertinent places in the scripture to direct your actions. But the key is to be familiar with the Bible, with God's word. So pick it up and read it. Actually read it. Actually look, open it up and actually read the words that are there. Begin with one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They tell the story of Jesus. Then read the Acts of the Apostles. That tells what the followers of Jesus did after he was died, uh, resurrected and died and resurrected. And then go back into the Old Testament. Read some of the charter myths of our culture, Genesis and Exodus, about the creation stories, our, our foremothers and forefathers in the faith. And then come and see me and we'll plot a reading course together. Join a Bible study, one of the four to six week ones we offer several times a year or or one of the Bible weekly uh, Bible studies that are going on. Meeting times are in the beacon and in each week's worship folder on the back page. There everyone, every single Bible study has room for more people. So go, learn the Bible. Here's Paul's admonition admonition to the church in Rome from Romans 12 too. He says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. And this is Paul's advice to Timothy. He says, every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks that God has for us. If you believe in Jesus, God has sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within you. The Holy Spirit brought with him gifts, special spiritual gifts. They aren't talents and skills like throwing a baseball well or or knowing how to bake an apple pie. They are gifts outlined in Holy Scripture and given to you for use in service to Christ. John 14, 26 talks about that. The friend, Jesus says, the friend, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send at my request, will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all the things I told you. If you'd like to know what your spiritual gifts are and how God has intended for you to use them, plan to attend a spiritual gifts class beginning uh, Saturday morning, January 21, a couple of weeks hence. It runs for three consecutive Saturday mornings, about two hours each time. I promise you, you will come away with new understandings about yourself and the mission to which God is calling you. Sign up on the information board, the entryway right out there. There's a list. Put your name on the list. 
from Proverbs 15. Knowledge flows like spring water from the wise. Fools are leaky fosters, dripping nonsense. If you're facing an obstacle that has you stymied, this family is chock full of dedicated, loving brothers and sisters who are anxious to help anyone who is struggling. We're blessed with so many wise and deeply faithful family members here. The good counsel is available just for the asking. Satan is always waiting to trip us up, to steer us into another trap. If you're teetering on the brink of a serious decision or facing the dilemma that's troubling you, use the resources God has made available to you. In the United Methodist tradition, we've always honored our ability to use the reason that God gave us, the wisdom of tradition, the importance of personal experience, and primarily the authority of Holy Scripture, the blessing of Holy Scripture. If you face something that scares you, then in this next moment, in this next moment, just bow your head with me and say this prayer in your heart as I say it. Savior God, You're always calling me closer. Help me to see the way, the ways you reach out to me. Help me to get past my own stubbornness and willfulness and really hear the advice that you have for me as it comes from the Bible, as it comes from your spirit, as it comes from my brothers and sisters. And give me the courage to act in a way that honors you. Thank you for all you give me, Lord. Help me be worthy of your goodness. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.